Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. first time or returning after a long visit, a long absence. Great. Well, we'll try to make you feel welcome during our after program. So, uh, my name is <coughs> Tom. My name is Stu. I'm also Walt. I'm Jerry. Peter. My name is Cass. Jack. Jim. My name is Clint. My name is Brad. Uh, my name is Harley. I'm George. I'm Joe Good. Anthony. My name is Freddie. I'm Kenny. I'm Michael. My name is David. My name is Lee. I'm Joe. Great. So, uh, welcome everyone. Today we have the pleasure of um, a pair of speakers, <laughs> Elia and Halima Van Tyle have been married for over 40 years, raised a family of four daughters in Palo Alto, and since 2005 turned their attention to problems of poverty among children in Cambodia. As co-founders of Friends of Cambodia, they have traveled many times to Asia to develop and fund programs for children who had been working and living at the infamous um, Stung Man Che, Stung Man che a garbage dump close to Phnom Penh. Their current focus is on the Cambodia Scholars Program, which aims at providing disadvantaged Cambodian youth with adequate education and training to successfully transition into adulthood without falling back into poverty. Details of their program and a link to a blog may be found at friendsofcambodia.org. Elia, Halima, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, uh, We've been looking forward to this, and <clears throat> it's really forced us to get together a slideshow of the latest uh, latest photos, too, so that's nice. Um, before we launch into that, though, I, I think maybe we should explain a little bit how two people living in a <laughs> suburb in Palo Alto ended up in Cambodia, because we don't have any Cambodian relatives or anything. Um, in 2005, I retired from business and I was looking for something useful to do with my life. Halima is a school teacher and I'm still teaching. Uh, and I looked into a lot of things and decided that I wanted to focus on, on poverty. There's so many people suffering in the world and I thought, well, you know, maybe there's something I could do about this. So in 2005, I traveled around. Asia with a friend who has a small philanthropy, a, a guy named Mark Gold, who has a philanthropy called 100 Friends Project. And I just said, I'll do some promotional materials for you if you just let me tag along behind you for a while. So I was seven weeks in Asia with Mark. Uh, we went through Thailand. We saw a lot of different poverty situations there. Then we went to Cambodia and then also to Indonesia where um, I visited Banda Aceh a year after the tsunami hit. That was a, uh, a biblical experience, I think. It was just, the, the flood was amazing there. Uh, but the thing that, that touched me the most was going to a garbage dump you know, outside of Phnom Penh where there's many, many people working as scavengers because they have no other alternative uh, to survive. Uh, including many children. So that's where the, the story starts. And I think what we're going to do is just tell you our story. Uh, uh, there's so much that's happened in six years that we're, 
I feel like we're going to race through this, but, but we're just going to give you some of the highlights of what we've been through in this period of seeing real need and, and wanting to help and then, then trying in, in a small way to, to help at least a, a few children there. So that's where the slideshow starts. And my part was, um, I remember several years ago I had a, a Cambodian refugee who was a custodian in my class and he would come in and after school he saw some geometry we were doing on board he'd go, Halima, you could, and he would write up a whole thing for the children and I said, Tech, what, what's your deal? And he says, well I want to be a math professor someday. So here he was as a janitor having survived in the, the woods of, of Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge and escaped to America. So the seed of Cambodia was definitely planted there. And another thing from long ago was a Thich Nhat Hanh saying, the garbage and the rose are one. And it had always bothered me, like, what do you mean, the garbage and the rose? And, and so I think that has been a thread of, of me discovering how this story that came into our lives is um, really at work in trying to reconcile these things of beauty and, and all of our shit. <laughs> So I'm going to be facing you and looking at the screen here, but you'll be seeing the same thing I'm seeing here because I just feel more comfortable facing you all. Um, as you see from the banner here, we have uh, an organization called Friends of Cambodia, which is, is our fundraising organization. Um, so that's what that's all about. And if you're, um, if you're interested in checking out uh, more about the situation in Cambodia, we have some cards out there that you can pick up a card that has a website on it if you're interested in that. Okay, so dump children in Cambodia being moved to help. Uh, this is this is a typical scene in a garbage disposal dump outside of Phnom Penh. There's garbage uh, trucks that come constantly dumping garbage and then just clusters of people picking through the garbage to find recyclable material. Uh, and uh, it's it, it's it's just an amazing sight. It, it stinks. It's hot. It's it rains, uh, and the people are there morning, noon, and night, uh, picking through. In detail, this just gives you an idea of you know what it's like right really on the ground. So it really makes an impression when you're there, especially because there's children. And so there are children working there all the time. This girl, I know this girl, and actually she's doing quite well now. Uh, and I know this boy. I don't know if he's doing so well now. But anyway, they, there's a lot of young workers at the dump. Uh, and many faces, many, um, many determined looks, some pretty grim. Um, it just made a a huge impression on me, wondering, you know, how on earth this could happen and <clears throat> what someone like me or Aluma and me together could do about this. Another girl at the dump, and you'll meet her later in, in the slideshow, not in person. And there's families at the dump, many families at the dump. This is very common. This is like a mother with three children who's been uh, abandoned by the father. That's just very, very common in, in the country. And kids that in other settings would be, you know, poster children for something are not here. And then there's a few old white guys with cameras running around. <laughs> uh, at the dump also, there's a lot of makeshift shelters. This is actually kind of a palace compared to a lot of them uh, where people live uh, because they have no other place to live and they're just sort of squatting, squatting on the land. They had, if you notice in that picture, also a little Buddhist um, shrine to the ancestors. That little temple. Yeah. And a lot of families, a lot of families hanging out. Brothers and sisters, very common to see siblings working together. The, the parents send them out to work out of desperation. This picture always touches me. You know, I took this picture, and uh, you know, this is a brother and a sister walking through this wasteland, and uh, 
you know, whatever they're happening in life, I, I, you know, siblings are very close in Cambodian families, and, you know, I wish them the best. The smoke that you see here is very common in the dump, too, because uh, it, there's a lot of methane fires. The methane builds up underground, and then it catches fire, and there's a lot of smoke, so it's very, uh, very unhealthy there. And children, you know, playing with dangerous stuff. I'm sure this is probably leaded paint on this, that this little kid is playing with a paint roller. And then just to give you an idea of, uh, of what it looks in real time, I have this one little video here. I don't know if I can And these tractors are working all the time, and it's really quite dangerous, and, and there's actually a lot of injuries that happen because of this, too. That boy with a lantern hat, he was working at night. And uh, this is very common, too. This is a mother and a daughter and a niece, and I happen to know in this case. Uh, they just come to work in desperation, and, and they're happy to if they can find a place for their children where they don't have to do this. Many of them are. And so we found an orphanage that was taking children and we, then we decided to become affiliated with the orphanage. Uh, and this is what it looked like back in, uh, in 2005. Uh, and it was a lot better than the dump and it would take kids in and feed them and put them in school. Uh, and so these are just a few pictures that I took the, the very first time I was there. You know, I met some nice kids. There. Some of them could speak English, you know, uh, reasonably well. So I couldn't speak Khmer. So, uh, but anyway, we decided because of that, Kalima then went back. I was there in November of 2005, and then we went back in the summer of 2006. Uh, this is other facilities of the same orphanage and we decided to become involved in, in working with the orphanage. And so the woman's gonna tell you a bit about that. So um, at the invitation of the director, I thought about what skills I had as a teacher that I could um, offer to share. And essentially, teaching English is always important because of uh, helping people with job opportunities, because it's a big it, tourism draw in Cambodia. Um, libraries, because there are not public libraries or school libraries in all of Cambodia, it, except for universities, and um, and also just to, to interact with the children and use some of my skills with drama. So we, Eli and I raised some money the first summer and brought um, a couple hundred picture books, and um, then also had some money to buy books in Khmer or bilingual books there, and we took a corner at the, li of the orphanage and ask if we could put some shelves up and create a little mini library. And it became a bigger library as time went on. And I trained some of the teenagers to be librarians. The, the man who's standing next to me is named Leon, and he was a worker at the um, employee at the orphanage. <coughs> and right away, he really got this library idea. And he wanted to read every book in the library himself. So he was instrumental. He was also a translator for me when I was teaching. I found a number of books, including this one, which tell the story of Cambodians, and they were so fascinated to see themselves in a story or something about their heritage, and this one was bilingual, and again, um, just the idea of how books are used in, in the American schools, where kids would be comparing or asking what the character's feeling, and all of that is not something they've ever experienced. They, they would just pronounce their textbooks in school, and that was what books were to them. So 
it was really wonderful to open that world. And uh, this woman in gray next to Leon, to the right of Leon, is, looks like a kid, but she's actually the head librarian at the university, Panya Sastra in Phnom Penh. She herself survived in the years of, of the Khmer Rouge and, and was able to share with the kids her own journey as it, coming from an abusive family and many tragedies to become the head librarian at this university. Uh, as you can see, we had lots of fun. The, these were some of the librarians, and uh, there were always time for laughter. And we uh, acted out a lot of the stories, so I brought drama into the picture, and we were acting out in, in English and also Khmer, so they would be, even people who couldn't speak English would be saying the story of whatever the folk tale was in English, and then they'd say it in Khmer. And I also helped to train the, the older teenagers to read and not just pronounce the words again, the story, but stop and ask people what's their favorite part or what they think is going to happen. As you can see, it's like these young librarians took their role very seriously. This is a wonderful mural. Um, so Leon, the, the employee I, I mentioned, he got a friend of his who's an artist, and we hired him to help the children create this mural in the library so the walls were just alive with beautiful creative children's art. Was that the Buddha? Part? Yes, it yeah. was, yes. And, and Buddhism, of course, every time we come and every morning and every evening you're always bowing in the tradition of Buddhist culture because Cambodia is a Buddhist culture. <laughs> um, so Leon, to, one, I, one idea I planted was the idea of mobile libraries, bookmobiles. And he took this idea and he created this thing, became the road show. So here he is with some of the, the young people, and he created not only a truck of books that they would take out to rural villages and to the dump where they'd come from, but also a road show that involved uh, skits about HIV, AIDS, um, landmines, domestic violence, trafficking. So they would basically spread out a tarp and gather an audience. This one's at the dump, uh, right beside the dump. So people would stop their work and come over because they'd have a loudspeaker generator. And kids would gather, adults would gather to hear the show and the message. And there was always humor in it. They had various characters and enacting even the grimmest tales. There would be parts of it that was humorous. Where costumes, outrageous costumes, make up. That was always fun. <laughs> and uh, out you can see to the right of this one, some of the scenes, this one we went to, literally right on the edge of a rice paddy. So people would stop their work. This was yeah. not it was a rural village. Rural village yeah. that they would go to. And um, this ghost, the, the guy there in the white and the big wig, is a ghost. They're a big part of Cambodian culture and lore. and. So man, this, this kid got everyone's attention, including some of the little kids who started moving backwards. Thought he was real. <laughs> Thought he was real, yeah. <laughs> and traditional Cambodian culture, they, they uh, even though these kids are dressed in jeans and, and t-shirts, they uh, definitely learn about their culture. And they, these are two of the youth in our program now who ha had the opportunity through an NGO to study Cambodian traditional dance. There's always question time to see if you got the message. And games, these two kids are trying to pop a balloon for a prize. <laughs> it's a very, very pop popular part. Leon, we noticed he was like magnetic, like he could just work a crowd. These are all kids who are strangers to him. He's kind of part camp counselor. And this is one of the teenagers who herself had been trafficked by her grandparents after her parents were d dead. And it found her way to the center. And again, this center is not a pagoda, but just part of the, the rural village, their, their gathering space. Yeah, so the Buddhist images everywhere. Yeah. Again, reading with children. And it wasn't all fun and games. The truck very regularly got stuck in the mud. This is going out to a rural village, and the kids would all pile out and try to and work together, not try, until it got unstuck. A moment, this is a youth in our program that I um, remember this day well. There was like a monsoon rain, and it was taking place in a little tin-roofed building, 
and the reading was going on despite the downpour of a monsoon, and 70 children were crowded into this place, all hearing stories <laughs> at the same time, and it was working. So I, I will forever remember that. Field trips is a part of something I started there because this went to a, a monument called Independence Monument. Some of the kids had never been there, and it's um, a way to show them about their own history of their country, and also I have them sit and sketch architecture features so that they are learning about their own heritage. And there's one of the drawings that didn't show up well, but they, they're it's really amazing artists, many of them. I also saw an exhibit of uh, a Cambodian artist who'd studied in France, and he'd studied modern painting. He's one of the few modern artists in Cambodia. He'd come back to the country. And so we took the kids and youth to this exhibit, and they sat in front of the paintings. They spread them out until they had to draw them or write about them. And they asked me, what? Malima, why is this woman sitting on books? And then I said, well, why do you think? And oh, because women can't read in many, in, women can't read in Cambodia, and she thinks they're chairs or stools. And um, so they interacted with these paintings, and this artist's name is Kim, Yu Kim, and he will later figure into our story. Okay, so that's what we did for almost four years working at the orphanage, but uh, the circumstances changed, and, uh, and so our program changed after a while because uh, our, our focus the whole time we were there was, yes, we want to rescue children from the dump uh, and give them a reprieve from poverty, but the real question in the end is, what's going to happen to these children when they become adults? Are they just going to fall back into poverty, or are they going to be able to sustain themselves? And one of the, I guess you could say, disappointments of, of what we did during that time was we found that, we, we felt that the orphanage was not preparing children, well, most of them at least, well enough to really survive as adults. Uh, so that there were, although at first the, the director was saying children need to continue education and graduate from high school and so forth and so on, uh, in the end uh, he changed his policy to one of, when you're 18, we'll give you some vocational training and then, then you're out of here. That was basically it, and we felt that there were many kids who were leaving the orphanage and really weren't prepared and weren't receiving particularly good uh, vocational training either. So this is just a typical real-life scene in Cambodia, nothing special about it. That was uh, the meat there next to everything <laughs> right. on the street and the motos yeah. going by. And you see a picture here of, of these young people in the back of a truck going someplace, and uh, you know that's a pretty standard... Uh, and then there's this shanty town next to the dump. It's just these pictures are just meant to remind us all life is difficult in Cambodia, and we really, after four years, we come to come very close and cared a lot about particular children and wanted to make sure that they wouldn't end up back where they came from. So the. For us, the question was whether they should continue in school or drop out of school because although there are some good vocational training programs, pretty much if you go into a vocational training program, that's it for school. So this shows some of the kids, while they were still at the orphanage, in, a, in an education program that we were able to get some funding for for a while. Uh, and they were, they were very interested, most of them, in, in continuing school, very motivated. Uh, this is a girl who's in our program now. We'll talk about her a little bit later. Uh, so, so these are some boys who, who got enrolled in a very good vocational training program by the orphanage. Uh, but still, the thing is that, that uh, some of them didn't really want to go, and now they're out of school, and they're metal fabricators, and, and that's pretty much what they'll be able to do. Uh, but then there are other things that the orphanage was doing, like hairdressing for the girls, which um, is not going to earn them a living, uh, or uh, sewing, and they learn some sewing skills, which is great, but really what that will qualify them to do is go to the local uh, garment factories, of which there are many, many, uh, and they could get a job there, but that, that would be about it. 
So, what we decided to do, there were a bunch of kids who left the program, uh, the orphanage program, and we gathered them together, and we decided that, especially these kids who were very well you. motivated, youth, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to say youth, rather, I'm an old guy, <laughs> we, I can We've known them from some of the time they were kids, but they're growing into young, right. young adults. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, we decided to change our focus to fundraising for a residential scholarship program, which is what we have for these particular youth now. Uh, and we found a wonderful partner, a woman seated there named Mui Yu, who is the wife of the artist. That, uh, oh. And and Yu Ken now is, uh, he died two years ago. Uh, Mui uh, is rather extraordinary because she was in France when the Khmer Rouge came in. She has a so she, she wasn't affected by that, by being killed in, in Cambodia, but she has a PhD in French literature, and she's a, uh, she has Montessori training, and now she runs a Montessori school in Phnom Penh, and she agreed to, uh, to help us out with, uh, with these particular youth. So we have an apartment for them, uh, and, uh, and we have a, a whole program. We, this, is, this is getting an apartment for the kids. This is huge luxury for them. And they were loving the wardrobes and things and feeling quite happy about it all. So we decided to, to change the program to focus on the needs of these youth because we wanted to make sure that they could survive as adults. And so this just shows they're still in school. Uh, another sort of sidelight to this is that we were able to reunite a whole family. Uh, uh, this is the, the two women on the, on the left there are mothers of kids in our program, and they were also had worked uh, in the orphanage for some time, and they're talking with Mui and then with one of their daughters there uh, about the new program. Uh, and so we were able to reunite this whole family here who had been separated by the orphanage system, and, and that's worked out really, really wonderful. By hiring them as our house mothers. Yeah, they're the house mothers. <laughs> For the program. Right. Okay, so Halima's going to then tell you about what happened last summer when we started this thing. So last summer we felt like we needed to kind of focus this program, what, what was our, our goal, and also how could we, um, we aren't going to be the parents of these kids, we aren't going to live in Cambodia full time, and we realized that it's really about getting them connected in a network there. Because that's the thing that foster kids here in the United States, you know, get thrown out of the system. And these youth in Cambodia were facing is they didn't have the network that comes sometimes from family and so forth. So we felt like if we could build on the strengths of any relationships we had and, and help those people become mentors for the youth that we had, it would help them to move forward. And so. Uh, these two extraordinary Cambodians, Leon, that you've heard about before, and then Santo. Santo worked briefly at the orphanage, but then left. And he's a teacher, so he and I have been uh, in planning, working side by side, planning lessons, and we've now hired him to be the English teacher and, and life skills teacher for the, the youth. He, um, we work with Mui in partnership also, and that's a picture of her late husband, Kim. Um, and she's created a gallery of his, his work at this guest house, which she started, very entrepreneurial woman, to support her Montessori school. So she's got a Montessori school, a guest house, that now it was number one on TripAdvisor after only, I don't know, a half a year, year or something. Yeah. Um, and she is really about the art. So she um, has hired some people, including this young man who's a guitar teacher, teaches classical guitar, and they also play Khmer Cambodian pop songs. No, and I never would in a million years have thought they would have gravitated to the guitar, but a lot of them did. So it's about this kind of expanding their world thing, and that's what these mentors are about. At the apartment, we have created a whole program with the house mothers and the youth of having um, decision-making, shared responsibility for all the chores, cooking, shopping, budgeting. They've never, never handled money before at all. 
they have a chance through our partnership with Mui to do online uh, computer work at the Siama Tre Montessori School, and they study Khan Math Academy, um, a wonderful <laughs> program that my own students study here, as well as, as English. T uh, Santo, teacher Santo, loves world cultures, and I've gotten some materials from him, including like these magazines. They're about 10 or 12 countries of the world, so he's teaching them about Japanese culture and they discuss everything under the sun. Get, he gets their opinions about things. He asks them to debate stuff. Um, this is a little light part of our life skills curriculum about uh, making decisions, handling conflict, budgeting money, um, rules, why are there rules at the house, at the apartment, why, what, when do they need to be you know, talked about, and so forth. Leon, there he is, buffed up. <laughs> he, he now has started also a program on his own of a library in a rural village. And now he's hired this young man from the village to be one of his libraries. I have to say because of Alima's training. <laughs> <laughs> this library thing is kind of catching on. And he has developed a program. Parents didn't want their kids hanging out at this library for a while, but he brilliantly thought of, okay, if your kid comes five days in a row and reads for 20 minutes, then you get a kilo of rice for your family. So parents were sending them like, <laughs> just, you know, find that little niche. And that's what we asked about. Here's the artist, it turns out I got to meet him finally, who now, who, who did the old murals in the orphanage. And now we hired him to work with the youth in our program to create murals for the Siamatui Montessori Library. And you can see a little bit, they're getting ready to go go team here. And here is the mango tree that's part of one of the now beautiful walls. Mm. Friendships are important. And sometimes at the orphanage, it wasn't a really a real space to talk about sorrows and <coughs> sort of buck up and eat your rice and do your work. And we've really found the, the youth uh, sort of flowering in their friendships with each other as we've had regular sessions with with a chance to talk about some of the traumas they've experienced. And the good moments, Louie offered us her kitchen, and which had a real stove, and uh, they have a sort of protein kind of thing in their apartment. And I introduced them to pancakes and flipping pancakes. So <laughs> they, were, they were happy with that experience. As well, um, we eat together sometimes, and that's Louie's apartment. And she is about alternate energy sources, too, in the future, and she has a solar oven. And so we did some cooking in this solar oven, which gets hot in Cambodia. About 35 minutes, it's preheated to 350. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one hot oven. <coughs> a new playground just opened in Phnom Penh, the first ever free playground for everyone. And so children, families, just off the streets who are living at the dump come here, but only at night, because it's so hot in the day, you wouldn't, couldn't touch the structures. But we went there to celebrate its opening with all the youth, and they had never experienced this during their growing up. So we were all kids again, and, and it was a great moment. <clears throat> OK, so uh, I just got back from Cambodia three weeks ago. so. Uh, I was there to follow up to see how things were doing, uh, see how the kids were going, and uh, and also to think about the future. And also, to, this is a process now we're going through of deepening our relationships with these kids. There's a tendency in Cambodia to put a happy face on everything. And I was there with a friend from, from Canada who also raises money, who has a Cambodian wife. And we, we spent a lot of time like hours talking with these kids and, and encouraging them to tell about their lives um, so they could really say what they've been through. And after I heard all of their stories, I, I will never complain about anything again. Oh, I didn't know. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> you're, on, you're being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so. I wanted to do something which is a little bit of trick photography, but uh, but it really expresses what I feel is really true and what I found with these kids. I want to show some photos of them a couple of years ago when they were at the orphanage, uh, and then some photos now. And of course, the photos now are very flattering, but I still feel it it it's, it They're speaks really the truth. They're really blossoming. Right. It's really 
We, we went on a vacation, so this is just a picture of, of some of them during the vacation. And some of them have never gone on a little trip like that to the seaside things. Oh, who knows? Okay. So this is Sanoi a few years ago, and this is her now. And Pisset and his sister Vitika, and Pisset and Vitika. Two more sisters. And this girl who is a fish. <laughs> and her sister. And this was, we were down in Sinekville at the South China Sea for our vacation. This is Renier. This is Ray. Pretty cool. So, in our program now, nine of the kids are in high school half day. One's, one's going to university and one's still in elementary school, geometry school, Moody school. And that's all you get is a half day in Cambodia. So the other half day, they go to geometry school, which is Moody school, and they study English, and this is Sento again. Uh, and we're very big on life skills, as Halima was explaining, and uh, they just really get along really well. This, the, the woman in the, with the handbag is the Cambodian wife of the guy over to the right, and, and the baby is hers, not any of our kids. <laughs> uh, and they just get along really well. And the families, this is the family I talked about. Uh, and this is the mom and the other daughter uh, who are also in the program. And I, I'm especially moved by the mothers because these mothers have had very, very hard lives. I mean, I, it's too long a story to tell, but, but, you know, this is the first time in their life they've ever had any free time, ever had any, any time to, to have fun and be what we would think as human beings. This is just a remarkable picture. This is a miracle, this picture. First time they've seen the sea. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Four hours away from where they Having are. fun, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, she looks like she's been a, you know, a gracious, regal woman her whole life, and, and she hasn't. And so networks, we're still big on networks. Mui is, is crucial to this. And the lady to the left there is Votai, who's the wife of our friend. And she just, she, she gives an interesting sort of uh, uh, role model for these kids. The kids were involved in plays at Siangtri School. This was a play about a, a, a Buddha's previous life called Savanatham. Uh, and and Pisset works part time at the guest house and you know chats up the foreigners a lot. Uh, and they all have their dreams. Uh, and, and we're going to get them through high school and, and through university if possible too. She wants to travel. She's way too nice to do that. <laughs> I know because I worked in banking. <laughs> and she wants to save the world through the program. Yeah. It, it, the, at first, she had this sign that said international relationships. And I said, no, <laughs> that's not quite it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so that's, that's where we stand now. And uh, so it's been a rewarding trip, and, uh, and we're glad we did it. So, so we wanted to leave a minute or two for questions. Yeah. Or we, we're here afterwards, too, but we just wanted to say... We, this this idea of you know rescuing someone is something that's really grown in us and and it doesn't it isn't just going and rescuing someone and it's really I think the Buddhist teaching of um, trying to eliminate suffering in the world and the causes of suffering and and that happens for all of us every day right right next to us and so it's not necessary to go anywhere but we ended up getting in Cambodia and learning some of these lessons there. We feel the richer for it. But we feel this notion of poverty is, is not just an, a, a condition, but it's a, it's a whole a, you know, set of environment. And one of the girls said it really well. She said, I used, she's the garbage dump girl, and she says, I used to have small ideas, but now I have big ideas. And I think she's like 
expanded and seen through the arts, through this education and network, what's possible. So we aren't out to change Cambodia, but I feel like somehow these lives we're connected to now, and we feel a real commitment to changing and helping, and they are certainly changing us. Does anyone have any questions? I have a couple of questions. <coughs> One, I'm wondering how you, how you negotiate with the parents when you identify a child as an appropriate candidate and, and what happens with the relationship between the family. And um, I'm wondering what benefit you might get from interacting with other nonprofits. Some of them, there are lots of really big nonprofits yeah. in Cambodia. I'm wondering if, mm -hmm. how, how, how that works for you. Or, the negotiating with the parents is, is interesting. We, we really don't do it personally because of the language barrier, but that's what, why Mui is so important, Mui Yu, because she does. And also Pisette, the, 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 the young man in this program, he did a lot of talking to parents too. And so when we started the, uh, the apartment, all the parents were invited over to see what it was and to allay any fears that they might have because they hear about foreigners coming and trafficking their children, you know. But when they saw that it was a nice place and the kids were happy and, and that Mui, and <clears throat> Mui was established and obviously a good person and uh, that's, that's how that happens. So it's really through intermediaries. And as far as, as dealing with, with larger NGOs, I mean, we are affiliated with a large NGO uh, called Give to Asia. That's how we raise money for the program. Uh, the thing about large NGOs is they, they all have their rules and regulations and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, and so, you know, we're happy with Give to Asia but we haven't like been trying to fundraise through, through other large organizations, uh, um, usually because they have their, their particular agendas and I don't know if they would it with ours or not. So we, we haven't done that. We're always open to, to new ideas. So. Yeah, go ahead. No, uh, no, thank you for, for a wonderful talk. And, and one of the observations that I had, you know, things that stuck out for me was that your commitment to follow through uh, the longitudinal aspect of that. Right. Because it's so, I imagine it's so easy to to go out there, do something, feel good about it, but then what happens next? Yeah. You're right. Then, and your uh, your emphasis on the well, education and networking, mm -hmm. so uh, and life skills are so so crucial. And uh, yeah. I wonder if you have that. You know, is this something that that can be scaled up in other ways? I mean, because it, it, you know, the, for this to happen, it took your commitment over many years. Right. Well, um, so, yeah, I think I think the answer to your thing is that as these uh, sort of the critical mass, the yeast here of Leon and Santo, some of the younger Cambodians start to see the importance of networks. They, they know about their family. It's a very traditional culture that way where you just look out for your family members, but there isn't so much, in a way, social connection in more random or ad hoc ways. And so I think they're starting to feel this themselves, and so perhaps from some of the Cambodians, this will come so that the strength of this program might be seen and, and replicated then in ways. But it is really true, the, the follow-up, it's just like you could go every day and take some kids out of that dump. And, and you leave and one month later or one year later, they'll be back there, or as parents, they'll be back there with their children unless something breaks that cycle. Yeah. So we had a speaker here a while back from Orom, uh, Organization for Refugees and Migration, and they focus a lot on uh, youth and beyond who are fleeing their country due to oppression, uh, largely based on sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you, I know that's not your focus, but what have you observed, or you know, is sexual orientation discussed there? How's it accepted? What are, you know? That's, your, that that's, an, interesting, yeah. that's an interesting question. Um, I would say that that on one level, no, it's very traditional, and and you know, 
there is there is not any tolerance at all on one level. On the other hand, it's a Buddhist country, it's an Asian country, and there is de facto tolerance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that that if you're gay in Cambodia, you are kind of um, mm, you know tolerated, but not not integrated. Not right? integrated, yeah. yeah. But there is, I think, again with youth, because uh, my daughter's also been there, and she's been in more touch with some Cambodian professional age, you know, 20 and 30 age people. So I think that same thing is, is somewhat happening of the change, that as people are just open to the world and the internet and, and the changing, you know, acceptance of the world in situations that this younger generation will be, throw off some of the, perhaps the old ways of prejudices. Um, but also there's a, I mean, we've seen a very, some very openly gay teenagers, and they don't, they don't seem to be stigmatized, I would say, in the way of they can be walking down the street or, right. you know, dressed or, you know, in, so, in, out in public in situations where they don't seem to have any fear from what I can see about their... And, and the other thing which I think is usually important is the king of Cambodia, yes. who is the son of Nordam yes. Sinuk, is gay. Yes. yes. Okay. He's, yes, gay. he's gay. And living in, and living in, in a palace with his, yes. his lover. lover. Yes. yes, that's right. right. And everybody knows. Everybody knows this, yes. Right. And the king or the king's son? The king's son. The king. the king. No, the king. he's the king now. He's the king, he's the king now. now. But he's, he's, he's the son of Nordum Siena. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right. So this yes. will change. <laughs> Party in the palace. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, another question off in a little bit of a different direction and may or may not relate to your background and interests. Uh, but I, I remember being very distressed by Cambodia during the Vietnam War because it, it seemed to me that it was, maybe very inaccurately, that it was a, a relatively bucolic society, not, not wealthy, not Western, but Mm -hmm. Without much, without the the kind of distress that existed over much of the world, and and then it seemed like they you know, mass madness overtook them for whatever reasons, and that changed. And so the the very distressing pictures of the dump at the beginning and and the situation. I'm just wondering on a on a wider social scale, is this stuff that's if, if you don't know. <coughs> has always been there, or was that part of the, the outcomes of that? The, the, the dumps, the dumps weren't there before, before the war. Nor that kind of, uh, it was much more like you said, a rural, rural society. They, they have incredible resources, incredible farmland. Mm -hmm. They were always able to feed themselves, and, and people were healthy eating fish and vegetables and rice. So right. this kind of um, urban poverty and urban um, the, the things have a very complicated threads, but um, that Elizabeth Becker... Yeah, there, there's a really good book yeah. called When the War Was Over by Elizabeth Becker, who was a, a New York Times reporter who was in Phnom Penh from 73 to 75 and then got kicked out at the last minute, uh, but then was one of three reporters that was allowed to come back and actually interviewed Pol Pot just before the Vietnamese invaded in January 79. And, and she's a very lucid writer and very clear. And she talks about that period of time, you know, from post-World War II up to the King of Rouge, uh, and gives us clear a picture yeah, of that. Really read that. Well done, mm -hmm. because many of us remember some way of hearing about the bombing, our country's bombing of the Cambodia, trying to get mm -hmm. the Viet Cong. And it's like she really elucidates the sort of world stage of Cold War stuff that in, was involved in that. And but it's not a simple situation. It's, yeah, it's not a simple situation. I think we have time for one okay. more. Okay. Hi. Um, I noticed in one of your slides you had life skills and there was like little lines. Yeah. Pat. And I, did you get those off Buddhist principles? Because I kind of looked, <laughs> I was reading them really quickly, but it was kind of, I can't remember what the one was. But uh, uh, do 
we have Buddhist principles? Well, I mean, you use Buddhist thing? principles as far as the life skills go. Oh, so, yeah. Well, we because they're very similar. I was in uh, India, and there was a school where they didn't call it Buddhist, uh -huh. but it was Buddhist principles. And so they would come in the morning, they would meditate, then they would talk about how they wouldn't fight with their brothers or sisters because they didn't want it. It was, yeah. it was a Halima school of Buddhist principles. <laughs> 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 we, we try to use everything from their culture in, in always like relating that back. So, so as I would teach them other things about managing money or something, we'd look at, it, does this match with what you know to be the best pr practice in life of caring for others as well as right. yourself? Well, I think you should be brought to the United States. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Halima, Elia, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you all. So it was wonderful to be here with you. Thanks for your, your attention. And, and if any of you have any more okay. questions you think about it, the cards out there is the email too. Feel free to drop an email anytime. And again, your website is friendsofcambodia.org. Friends of, friends of Cambodia yeah. Great. Thank Great. You. Thanks so Thanks. much to everyone. Thank you. Do we have announcements? Okay. I'm Jim, I'm your host. Um, thank you guys so much for yeah. being here. Um, they're old school pals of mine. Yes. Um, we have refreshments. We have some, a lemon loaf and a banana loaf, I think, and some pineapple. And there's tea. Um, so if you have some tea, please wash your cups in hot, sudsy water, put them on a rack. And if the cake crumbles on the floor, please pick up the crumbs because that goes around. There is a diamond bowl, which I will be posted at the shelf at the coat rack. You shall not pass. <laughs> <laughs> the diamond bowl. Um, without leaving something in it, our, our, our uh, suggestion is five to eight dollars, but feel free to add zeros or just be really extravagant. Um, <laughs> Uh, a, a group of people typically uh, will meet casually at the door around 12.30 to go out to lunch. Um, there is a sign-up sheet if you want us to be in touch with us or for us to be able to reach you with our newsletters or our um, uh, email announcements. And... I think that's it. People can... Yeah, uh, thanks again. Mm -hmm. uh, next week our speaker is going to be Heather Sundberg. She's a She's been here about four times. Some of you may be familiar with a book called The Velvet Rape, which was a, a widely read book about gay people and some of the psychodynamics that the mm, very insightful author has upon him that overlays gay consciousness. And he's going to be speaking two weeks from tomorrow afternoon in a group called the Gay Healer Circle over here at uh, what's that hospital? Babies Hospital. And I'll, I might put a link on the website to <coughs> on uh, getting more information about asking about that. Thank you. Oh, one other just footnote. And so that custodian who worked at my school so many years ago is now a math professor. He teaches at Evergreen Community College, and he's a father also, a family. Anything else? Thank you very Jim, would you like to share with the rest of us? We were wondering if you were going to mention the letter. Oh, oh thank you. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, Larry Wish, longtime friend and member of Sangha, passed yesterday. Um, he was in Berkeley, surrounded by some of his relatives and his partner, the longtime partner, Giancarlo. Um, and so some of you may know Larry, and he would come and go as his health allowed uh, towards the end, but apparently a peaceful transition. So please keep me in your thoughts, Giancarlo. Giancarlo Calabresi has just been magnificent.
very true. Um, right? Larry has been struggling with HIV, or, or uh, was a real warrior in uh, taking non-traditional medical routes for um, dealing with HIV. He was always on a natural path and uh, uh, was quite heroic in, in uh, his commitment to that. He was a cancer survivor also. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the founders of Three Stone Heart. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. before that, he had had a very successful marketing business. Yeah. And a beautiful garden, a fabulous garden. Mm -hmm. And the singing group, the Coral Majority. Oh, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Coral Majority. Coral Majority. That's <laughs> Larry. <laughs> well, let's uh, gather in a circle for a dedication. By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.